He is risen. He is risen I think many of you are probably aware of the publication called The Onion. Any of you? All right, I see a few smiles out there. You know what it's all about. I, it, it, it's weird. I guess the only thing you could call it is a fictitious newspaper. Uh, it's a newspaper, but all of the stories are fictitious, and they are, they're, they're kind of a, usually some type of a satire on life in general. And a while back, there was an article in this one uh, called um, World Death Rate Holding Steady at 100%. The story went something like this. Actually, not something like this, exactly like this. World Health Organization officials expressed disappointment Monday at the group's finding that despite the enormous efforts of doctors, rescue workers, and other medical professionals worldwide, the global death rate remains constant at 100%. Death, a metabolic affliction causing total shutdown of all life functions, has long been considered humanity's number one health concern. Responsible for 100% of all recorded fatalities worldwide, the condition has no cure. I was really hoping what with all those new radiology treatments, rescue helicopters, aerobic TV shows, and what have you, that we might at least make a dent in it this year. Who Director General Dr. Gernst Blatt said, unfortunately, it would appear that the death rate remains constant and total as it has inviolably since the dawn of time. A little bit of satire there as we look at the inevitability of death in our world. But there is maybe one uh, word or verse in there that we could uh, challenge a little bit where it says, um, responsible for 100% of all recorded fatalities worldwide. The condition has no cure. I don't know, maybe it is correct to say that there is no cure for sickness and death, but there is a way to overcome it. And it's called resurrection. And Jesus was the first to do it. And just as this article, the satire, promotes the idea that death is inevitable, our human minds, you know, tell us that the resurrection is just as improbable. And I can assure you that on that Easter morning, nobody was expecting it. In fact, there was on that Easter morning a profound and an unexpected change. So if we want to try to get a sense for what they went through, what that profound and unexpected change might have looked like in their lives, I guess what we could do is we could ask ourselves, have we ever been through a profound and unexpected change? And that might help us get a feel for what they went through that morning. I don't know about you, the only profound and unexpected change that I can think of in my life was when I decided to become a pastor. And I was sitting in my living room contemplating a job change. Several years earlier, I had taken severance from my uh, career job as a research geneticist and uh, in order to not move my family a second time in three years. And so I had worked locally for a company for a few years, a, a company that sold greenhouse products that were produced over in Israel. And then that opportunity closed, which br brings me then to that profound moment in the living room. I had over the years considered the idea or the thought of becoming a pastor, but never really seriously. And there was one morning Jennifer walked out the door and she said, if you really want to do it, I'm game. So I spent all morning in prayer and thought and consideration. And after uh, uh, that prayer, uh, and with four kids in college or college age and one in high school, I was convinced that I also needed to go back to school in order to become a pastor at the ripe old age of 48. And uh, just like that, within a few months, we had moved to St. Louis and our new journey began and what a profound 
and unexpected change that was. What's your story? Have you had a profound and unexpected change in your life? Something that rather happened rather quickly and you didn't put maybe a whole lot of thought into it, maybe a little spontaneous, then all of a sudden it ended up having a very profound uh, uh, impact in your life, a major change or direction. Uh, have you, maybe you've you got stories, or maybe all of you had boring and expected sto- uh, lives to, uh, <laughs> to live uh, without a lot of excitement. But um, whatever your story is, I'm, I, and, and definitely my story, it pales in comparison to what was experienced on that first Easter morning. It was three days before that Jesus had been arrested, and he was nailed to that Roman cross. And as he was being crucified, his followers fled and they went underground, cowering in fear for their own lives. But on that first Easter Sunday morning, uh, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene and one of, Je- one of Jesus' close friends went to the tomb and where Jesus had been laid. And this tomb actually was a cave in a, in a garden area And the Gospel of John, uh, as we read at our early service today, tells us that she was weeping, standing in front of the cave, and then she bent down to peer into the cave and saw two figures dressed in white. They were angels. They looked at her and said, Woman, why are you crying? And Mary said, Well, they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. She then saw someone she assumed was the gardener, and it was actually Jesus, though she didn't recognize him. And it was that first Easter Sunday morning that Mary, she was not anticipating that her friend Jesus would rise from the dead. This was totally unexpected. And for good reason. I mean, you know, today, you know, not everybody believes in the resurrection, but at least everyone has heard of the resurrection. Everyone has at least had a time to consider the thought that someone could or could not rise from the dead. Mary didn't even have that. No such story in her mind. You know, the Jews did have a concept of resurrection. Not all of them. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. But even when they believed that it was going to be at the very end of the world, the the judgment uh, at the end of time, and it would be for everybody, not just one person. So there was no inkling, no idea in her mind that this could even be considered a possibility. So she looks at this man in the garden, who she assumes is the gardener, and he looks at her, perhaps with a twinkle in his eye, and simply says, Mary. And as he speaks her name, her eyes are opened. And she realizes it's Jesus. And she is just overwhelmed with joy and embraces him. And so it is profound, unexpected change, which brings for us this morning a profound and unexpected joy. I love Pastor Ken uh, Shigo Matsu's uh, take on this scene. He writes the following. He says, How long do you think it would have taken for Mary to have turned from the cave to Jesus? That turnaround that she, she made. Maybe a second, maybe two. Dale Bruner, a respected commentator, says that as Mary turned and saw Jesus, It was as if the world was also turning on its axis, just slightly. And she turned one second into her turn, and it was as though the world had shifted from B.C. to A.D. One second before, Mary had been the woman agonizing in the depths of sadness in the face of unconquerable death. A second later, Mary is experiencing the highest possible human joy in the presence of the one who has conquered death. Mary was, in fact, the first person in history to see Christ risen from the dead and the joy and the elation she must have felt 
must have been unimaginable. So here's our take home this morning. As people meet the...